The following program was made possible by the generosity of those who have determined to hold fast to the true Roman Catholic religion, as expounded by the Roman Catholic Church before the disasters of Vatican II and the so-called New Mass. Now, I'm going to uh, take up Lesson 2 here in our book, A Brief Catechism for Adults, a complete handbook on how to be a good Catholic by Father William Cogan. And Lesson 2 has the title, The Bible and Tradition. And Father Cogan begins with this quote from uh, the book of Hebrews, chapter 1, verse 1. This is the same verse which he gave before chapter 1 of the book. God, who at sundry times and in diverse manners spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, last of all, in these days hath appointed, has spoken to us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world. Now the first question Father Cogan asks here is, what is the Bible? And he answers, uh, the Bible is a collection of the writings which were inspired by God. And he quotes uh, from the second epistle of St. Paul to Timothy, chapter 3. All scripture inspired by God is profitable to teach, to reprove, to correct, to instruct in justice, that the man of God may be perfect, furnished to every good work. Now, giving us that uh, quote from Sacred Scripture, um, St. Paul, and the one quoting St. Paul, Father Cogan, uh, wants us to understand the meaning of the statement. All Scripture inspired by God is profitable to teach. There are those who would twist that into saying that the Bible contains all of God's revelation. Uh, that is not what this quote says, though. It merely says that all that God has revealed, all the written revelation of God, is profitable for teaching and reproving and correcting and instructing. And that is the absolute truth. When we talk about the Bible, we're talking about the written revelation of God. Now, uh, the written revelation of God often uh, came in tradition as it did in, uh, in the, the New Testament scriptures, uh, as it did with the Gospels themselves, which were preached by the apostles, and, uh, well, two apostles and two evangelists wrote them down. But before they were written down, the Gospels were oral tradition from the apostles, who were ordered by our Lord to go and to preach the Gospel. You don't find in the Gospel anywhere our Lord commanding them to write them down. They were inspired to do so by the Holy Ghost, and that is where the written Gospels came from, which we know as part of sacred Scripture. So when we say that the Bible is Scripture, we're simply saying, well, the, the, the word uh, uh, biblos, the word for book in, in Greek, is simply meaning here for us the written Word of God. That's what sacred scripture is. And uh, he asks in second, the second question, what does inspired by God mean? And he answers, it means that God chose some men and moved them to write down faithfully all the things and only those things which he wanted written down. And here, uh, Father Cohen quotes uh, the second epistle of St. Peter. For prophecy came not by the will of man at any time, but the holy men of God spoke, inspired by the Holy Ghost. And so when we say that the scriptures were inspired by God, that's the sacred scriptures, inspired by God, we mean that God moved them. That the Holy Ghost actually moved them. First of all, he moved their intellects to know the truth. He inspired them so they infallibly knew and understood the truth that he was teaching them, and then he moved them actually to make an act of the will, to take a pen or a quill in hand and actually write down in human words, in human language, and with 
perfect accuracy, as far as the human word can, uh, write down the truth that they were that they were inspired to understand by the Holy Ghost. So they conveyed uh, in writing what they knew in their minds uh, to be true because the Holy Ghost has inspired that, that knowledge in them. And so this process of their committing to writing uh, the sacred scripture uh, involved their intellect, their will, even mechanically, their power of, of operating the pen to convey the knowledge that the Holy Ghost had given them in their minds on to parchment or the written word of man we call scripture. So we know that uh, what was written there uh, by the earliest uh, sacred writers uh, actually did come from the Holy Ghost in a and expressed in a manner that uh, would state clearly the truth that he had inspired in their minds. Now, number three, who then is the primary author of the Bible? The answer is God is the author, since he moved these men to write down the things he ordered, although he allowed them to write in their own language and style. And that is a fact. You'll find in the sacred writers uh, evidence of their own style. God did not, did not uh, possess them, in a sense, uh, taking control of their hands and their brains. Um, God inspired the thoughts in their minds, and allowed them to express themselves in a style that was characteristic of them. You find this in the Gospels, for example, where each of the evangelists uh, has a certain, oh, his own personal style and character, and uh, his own manner of expression. The point being, though, that God used them to convey the truths that he wanted us to all know. Uh, and have with us uh, throughout the ages in the sacred scriptures. So God did not uh, uh, take possession of them so that they were mindless instruments. Uh, the pen in the hand of the evangelist is totally under his control, has no power to express itself in any way other than what the evangelist makes it do. But the evangelist, the gospel writer, was not controlled by God in the same way that, uh, <clears throat> that the, the gospel writer worked a pen. God did not take possession of a prophet the way a prophet would pick up a pencil or a quill. Uh, God allowed the, the human mind and the human agency and the human ingenuity of, um, of the sacred scripture writer <clears throat> to come through and to express itself, <coughs> even when he's writing down divine truths. Uh, this is a manifestation of God's respect for us uh, and our liberty, even in using us as his knowing and willing, intelligent instruments of conveying his truth. Now, number four, how many writings or books are there in the Bible? The yeah, answer so there are 72. Actually, there are 45 books in the Old Testament, and there are 27 books in the New Testament. Uh, when were all these writings put together? The answer is the Catholic Church put all of them into one book, God is gathering them all together and declaring them to be inspired works of God between the years 350 and 405. Now, this might be surprising to some people who wonder, well, sacred scripture was not actually compiled as such and defined as such by the church until uh, 300 years after Christ was born. Three centuries had passed. And uh, as startling as it might seem to some people, it actually uh, is very important uh, to face that reality. And it tells us something very important for us to know, too. Um, that the Catholic Church was the agent of this. The Catholic Church was the one that actually gathered all of these sacred writings and authoritatively declared which were the sacred writings, which were the books, 
in human hands uh, that were inspired by God. And so she compiled the Bible as we know it today. Even Protestants have to, in looking back in history, have to realize that the Bible that was known as sacred scripture by not only generations but centuries of Christians was defined as such by the Catholic Church. For the first time, with the authority necessary to distinguish between writings that were apocryphal, that merely claimed to come from God, and writings that really did come from God, that there was required here on earth an authority that could make that judgment. And that was the Catholic Church that did that. And uh, the fact that that judgment took place between 350 and 405 was also very important because the church herself existed already for, well, my goodness, if the church was established in the year 33 when our Lord died on the cross, that would have meant that the church existed uh, for uh, 400 years, uh, going on 400 years before the last statement of the canon of sacred scripture was authoritatively decided by the church. At the very least, if we take the earliest years, uh, the later 300s, the church would have existed for um, uh, 300 and maybe 50 years. And the church was teaching, teaching the gospels, was preaching the gospels, uh, converting, saving souls. Generation after generation of Christians went before the judgment seat of Christ. Um, martyrs uh, went before the judgment of uh, their earthly judges, the magistrates, uh, the procurators, the emperors, who then condemned them to die, and they willingly gave their lives for our Lord and appeared before our Lord's judgment seat then and were saved and had eternal life. All of this was going on for not only decades, but centuries before the canon of sacred scripture was decided. And when it was decided, it was decided by the authority of the church. So it's important for Protestants who have fallen into the trap of Martin Luther's teaching, the Bible alone or scripture alone, to realize the church came first. Oh, certainly the, the gospels were written down uh, before the year 350 A.D., no doubt about it. But even when the Gospels were written, the Church had already existed. The Gospel was already being preached by the Apostles and those who came after them. And souls were being saved. Long before there was a quote-unquote canon of sacred scripture. The word canon comes from the Greek meaning standard or official rule. It was the Catholic Church who decided what was the standard and what was the official rule of divinely inspired books that belong in the Bible. In other words, what really are sacred scripture. And uh, the Church could do that because she had the authority of Christ to do so. He had invested that authority in the Church when he sent out his apostles. So, um, what was happening before then? What was happening before the church made this decision? Well, during the first few hundred years of the church's existence, uh, the church had the Gospels, but there were also other writings that had been intruded by forgers and fakes and charlatans who composed fake Gospels. Uh, many of these today are known as the Gnostic Gospels. Gnosticism tried to, as it were, co-op the Church of Christ to uh, find a way to extend its evil influence over and almost swallow alive Christianity. Gnosticism is a very evil thing. Um, it had as its basic idea that human beings are God, that we, our souls, are fragments of God, imprisoned in this world by the evil God. And the world is in prison, is imprisoned and a prison for the fragments of, 
of the true God. The evil God, the Gnostics said, imprisoned, uh, I, I would put it this way, the evil God shattered the true God into so many shards as you'd shattered a, a, a crystal vase into shards of, of, of tiny fragments and then imprisoned all those pieces of the true God, our souls, in this world and kept us imprisoned here by his commandments. That is the creator God of this world, the evil one. And we escape his clutches by accepting Gnosticism, that is, well, the Gnosis, the knowledge that we are God, each of us, personally, we are God. This is like the New Age movement all over again. In fact, Gnosticism is nothing but an extension uh, today into the New Age movement, the whole idea of the New Age movement. And that uh, as so many fragments of God, as we, uh, as we dissipate back into uh, whatever it is, we're all sort of coalescing back into God again, as God is being reassembled, as our souls are all being reabsorbed, as it were, by God. Anyway, Gnosticism has taken many different forms, and I've just given you some very, a very basic idea, the most basic idea of all of Gnosticism. But the essential idea of Gnosticism is uh, the idea of the devil, what he taught Eve in the garden, what he tempted her with, that if you defy the God who created you, the creator God, you will recognize that you are God. You'll be your own God. It's the same story that people have been following for century after century, generation after generation, life after life. He's been trying to fall into that same trap. Make yourself your own God. It's the, the, out, it's the, um, the outcome of existentialism, which has you create your own world around yourself, and you are the creator of your own world from your own experiences. Uh, the same siren song of Satan is right there. Be your own God of your own little world. Uh, create your own world for the sake of being your own God. And uh, it is the work uh, not only of the New Age movement, but of the, the theosophical societies. Uh, basically, they have foisted upon mankind the idea now there's going to come a world teacher, whom they call Lord Maitreya. And this Lord Maitreya is going to come into the world and he's going to be the new savior of mankind. And his message is going to be this. He's going to teach mankind that it is God. It's something, it's just Gnosticism by another name. is all it is. The same old story that Satan has found so, so tempting to us in our pride. Now, the reason I'm mentioning that is that Gnosticism tried very hard to swallow alive uh, Christianity and to bring it into the Gnostic fold and make of our Lord simply one of the eons or one of the messengers of, uh, of uh, this gnosis. Um, but, of course, by the grace of God, uh, Christians were spared from that pit, that trap, because Christ had given authority and guidance, the guidance of the Holy Ghost to his church. And so the church fought hard against this evil doctrine and managed to escape its clutches. Not everyone did, though. Many fell into the clutches of Gnosticism. They fell under the influence of these false gospels. The point is, though, that in the early days of the church, in the first centuries, there were many of these false scriptures that were written by charlatans and uh, actually purported to be gospels according to St. Peter, gospels according to Mary Magdalene, even gospel according to Judas. And they were, they were in circulation, put into circulation among the Christians and uh, used as traps. This was satanic. And it really needed uh, the power of the Holy Ghost to enable the church uh, not to fall into the open mouth of that monster. Do you remember in the, in the book of the Apocalypse, the last book of the Bible, there's an image of a woman clothed with the sun, a crown of 12 stars on her head. She's giving birth and the dragon is waiting for her to give birth so the dragon may devour her child. 
when the church sees that woman clothed with the sun as the church herself or our blessed lady, an image of our blessed lady, and the child being our blessed lady's son, our Lord Jesus Christ, the church herself, us, and the dragon waiting to devour. And uh, this uh, could very well be an image of, uh, of Gnosticism. Uh, wanting to devour uh, Christianity, Christians, the church, from the very womb, from its very inception. And uh, it did not succeed in doing so. So uh, the church uh, had these false, uh, false books circulating. Uh, during the years of persecution, it was very difficult for her to exercise uh, her a magisterium, as it were, um, and communicate throughout the world uh, when Christianity was illegal. Um, but she did find that she had to condemn false scriptures as they came out. And yet they were coming out in a kind of storm. They were being produced by the dozens as the years went by. And um, if you knew the circumstances of the time, taking into consideration the circumstances, the church up against great obstacles because of her persecution had to deal with this terrible flurry, this terrific storm, not only of the persecution from without, but this attempt to subvert her, even from, quote-unquote, within. And so... Uh, she finally, in uh, the 300s, or the late 300s, issued that once and for all authoritative statement saying, these are the inspired works of God in the sacred scripture. All else is not. It is either just pious literature, the work of human beings, or even impious literature, perhaps even the work of devils, to subvert the faith and must be rejected. But the books we know in the Bible have been defined as such as sacred scripture by the Catholic Church back in the late 300s. Now, how is the Bible divided? That's the sixth question. It is divided into two main parts, the Old Testament and the New Testament. Of course, the dividing line there is our Lord, the coming of our Lord. The Old Testament has to do with the creation of the human race, the fall of man, and the promise of a Redeemer. And then all about the New Testament, the Old Testament, is the preparation for the coming of that Redeemer. And the New Testament begins with the actual coming of that promised Redeemer. Here's what Father Kogan says. The Old Testament contains the things God told the human race from the beginning of the world up to the coming of His Son, Jesus Christ. The New Testament contains what God has told us through His Son and through His Apostles and others. And uh, question seven, is it possible to misunderstand the Bible? And the answer Father Kogan gives is, yes, even the Bible itself says so. And here, uh, Father Kogan quotes the second epistle of St. Peter. As also in all his, St. Paul's, epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are certain things hard to be understood, which the unlearned and unstable rest or twist as they do also the other scriptures to their own destruction. <clears throat> now, these are the words of St. Peter in his second epistle. And uh, from that statement of St. Peter, which is part of sacred scripture, it is divinely inspired word from God, we find that uh, St. Paul's epistles, even during the lifetime of St. Paul, were being twisted and uh, turned uh, to a false interpretation. And uh, even to the point that St. Peter says, people, the wicked are turning these things to their own damnation. Taking sacred scripture and twisting its meaning to their own damnation, uh, that's uh, pretty serious. But not only was it the epistle of St. Paul's, the epistles of St. Paul that were being turned this way, but St. Peter also says that the unlearned and unstable were uh, twisting the other scriptures also to their own destruction. But we know that, that you can take 
<clears throat> the written word. And, uh, you can ask five people uh, for an opinion and get ten different opinions. Um, this is the way people are. Their interpretation varies. Uh, the written word needs an interpretation. It is not its own interpretation. <clears throat> and so, Scripture must be understood in context. And you must understand it in the, in the way it was meant. Uh, the written word can be, uh, can be twisted and turned according to one's own particular bent and according to one's own particular interests. Well, how do we guard against that? I mean, did our Lord die on the cross and say to us, Well, uh, I've lived among you for 33 years. For the last three years I've taught you about the kingdom of God, about the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> and so, now that I'm dying on the cross, I wish you good luck. And try to figure out what I really meant. Is that what our Lord left us? That would be blasphemy to suggest this such a thing. And if he left us only the sacred scriptures that eventually were written down from the uh, tradition of the apostles, the teaching of the church, uh, if that's all our Lord left us, did he leave us nothing but a book of riddles to fight over what it really meant? I mean, after all, uh, the Protestants following Luther believe in private interpretation. They believe that the Spirit, uh, the Holy Ghost, whom we know as the Holy Ghost, uh, inspires them to understand what it means, and yet he understands, he inspires them to understand, to mean different things. But God cannot contradict himself, so obviously that is not working. There must be a way to understand sacred scripture for the way it was meant, <clears throat> the way it was actually inspired in the mind of the sacred writer. That context we know as sacred tradition. Uh, and that leads to the next question. Is everything that God taught in the Bible? The answer is no. Uh, there are things that God has committed to us in sacred tradi tradition. In fact, the very Gospels were at first committed to us in sacred tradition. As I mentioned, they were preached by the Apostles long before they were written down. Uh, St. John's Gospel is quoted here by Father Kogan, chapter 20. Many other signs also did Jesus in the sight of his disciples, which are not written in this book. No one could argue that St. John is referring to his own fourth gospel, <clears throat> the last of the gospels to be written. <clears throat> and one would say, well, yes, of course, there were many other things that Jesus said that St. John didn't write down. But if we take the, the Bible as one complete book of God's revelation, <clears throat> we still can see that this is true. There are many things that Jesus did that are not written down anywhere in the Bible, not just in the gospel of St. John, but in any of the Gospels, <clears throat> in any of the books of the New Testament, certainly in any books of the Old Testament, there are many things that our Lord said and did. St. John even ends by saying, uh, if all the things that Jesus, our Lord and Savior, taught and did were to be written down, he thought, and he said this by way of hyperbole, that even the world could not hold all the books that would have to be written. Nonetheless, <clears throat> we know for a fact that there are things that Jesus taught and that the apostles taught that are not, were not, and still are not written down in sacred scripture. But they exist in the tradition of the church. And uh, one of the things that I would mention to you is simply this, and I ask those who doubt this, to go find out for themselves, prove it to themselves. Ask, yourself, uh, ask yourselves if what our Lord taught... Um, from the time of his resurrection to the time of his ascension is important. For 40 days our Lord remained here, appearing to the apostles and talking to them, teaching them about what? About the church, about what our Lord said in his parables was the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, <clears throat> referring to the church here on earth. <clears throat> How do we know that? Well, the sacred scripture itself tells us that. Open the Acts of the Apostles. Chapter 1, verse 1, what does St. Luke say there? <laughs> that our Lord remained here for 40 days, teaching the apostles about the kingdom of God on earth, teaching about the church. 
<clears throat> look, see for yourselves. This is what the divinely revealed Word of God says our Lord did during that time. But then go try to find what our Lord taught during those 40 days. Try to find it written down anywhere. Try to find it written down in the Gospels. After all, go to, go to the end of St. John, uh, St. Matthew's Gospel <clears throat> and find what, what it is of our Lord's 40 days worth of teaching from his resurrection to his ascension that is actually written down by St. Matthew at the end of his Gospel. And the answer you find is the Gospel of St. Matthew goes from the resurrection to the ascension. <clears throat> and it concludes with our Lord uh, sending his apostles to and preach the Gospel to all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son of the Holy Ghost, and instructing them to observe all things that he, Christ, had commanded them to do. The fact is, that during those 40 days, our Lord was instructing them exactly uh, on what they were to preach, and what they were to do in, bapt in baptizing, and what they were to do in living their lives. And our Lord was referring precisely to that teaching, when he told the apostles to go carry it throughout the world. And yet, St. Matthew does not detail what our Lord said to the apostles during those 40 days. Go to the Gospel according to St. Mark. Go to the resurrection of our Lord, the end of St. Mark's Gospel. See what St. Mark tells you about our Lord's teaching during those 40 days. St. Mark goes from our Lord's resurrection to his ascension. Go to the Gospel of St. Luke. <clears throat> See what St. Luke tells you. What did our Lord teach during those 40 days? St. Luke goes from the resurrection of our Lord to his ascension. <clears throat> You're running out of Gospels at this point. <clears throat> Go finally to the Gospel of St. John. And then find that St. John does, in fact, tell you. He tells you some things of what our Lord taught during those 40 days. <clears throat> and the very things that Protestants refuse. They will not accept. That our Lord gave to his apostles, to his church, the power to forgive sins. Uh, that he named Peter to be his shepherd, the shepherd of the flock. You, Peter, you feed my lambs, you feed my sheep. These are the things that St. John relates of our Lord's teaching during those 40 days. And yet they're the only things of all the teachings of all those days <clears throat> so crucial and so important. Uh, these are the only things that are actually written down in the Gospels of our Lord's teaching. So uh, just please uh, accept the fact that sacred scripture does not convey all the truth that our Lord taught. That when the apostles began to work and to do and to teach, as St. Luke says in Acts of the Apostles, they knew what to do precisely because our Lord had instructed them what to do. And these instructions he gave them during those 40 days and you're not going to find those instructions in the words of our Lord in the Gospels. You'll find those instructions being lived and carried out by the Apostles in the Acts of the Apostles. That's sacred tradition. Um, and that tradition still remains in the traditions of the Catholic Church. Traditions which the modernists are all trying to get us to forget now. And yet, which we will never forget because they are the work of Christ. It is he who inculcated them into the church. He's, in, he's the one who instilled them into the apostles and instilled them into the church till this very day. And we're not going to part with these sacred traditions any more than we're going to, chart, uh, any more than we're going to part with sacred scripture because they belong together. And sacred tradition is the context in which sacred scripture can be understood correctly. And that brings us to number 10. What is tradition? <clears throat> and the answer is the unwritten word of God. These, quote, other things Jesus did were handed down by word of mouth by the apostles and other close followers of our Lord, uh, as in the evangelists and St. Paul and so on. And here we find uh, Father Kogan quoting the second epistle of St. Paul to the Thessalonians, chapter 2. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions which you have learned, whether by word or by our epistle. You know, it's worth pausing here about this particular quote that Father Kogan has chosen from Second Thessalonians chapter 2 about tradition. 
Because if you open your Bibles and you go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, you find that this is the chapter of St. Paul about the coming of the Antichrist, the coming of the son of perdition, the man of sin, and the great apostasy. And St. Paul is saying that the answer for the faithful to remain faithful to our Lord, even in those latter times of the world, the time of the coming of the Antichrist, will be to stand fast and hold the traditions which you have learned, whether by word or by our epistle. So you see, you see what St. Paul is saying here. He's saying, hold fast to the traditions which you've learned. And we learn these traditions in two ways. By word of mouth, he says, or by written word, as he says, epistle. And so uh, word of mouth is tradition. Epistle, he also refers to that as a part of tradition. It's a very serious mistake to uh, dislodge sacred scripture from its rightful place because <clears throat> sacred scripture actually comes to us from tradition, not the other way around. It's as though uh, we're talking about a piece of the finest jewelry you have sacred scripture as a beautiful gem, but a beautiful gem is not just something you toss around in your hand. It's in a setting which accentuates, its, which enables its beauty and its grandeur to be really appreciated, and that setting is sacred tradition. <clears throat> uh, you may have a, a, a diamond, a, a carrot, or a, a two, or three, or five, or whatever it is, but it's basically just a rock you, know, you can toss around. It's not a piece of jewelry until you put it into a setting of gold. And uh, that setting enables it to be like a ring or an earring or something very beautiful or a pendant. And it enables you to appreciate the, the beauty of the diamond itself. And the, in this case, uh, by analogy, I'd say the diamond is sacred scripture. But the ring... <coughs> uh, the necklace is that of gold, of sacred tradition. And uh, once you dislodge that stone, uh, it falls and it's lost. And it does become a book of riddles. So it does violence to the sacred scripture to separate it from sacred tradition. Because only in the context of sacred tradition can sacred scripture even be understood for the truth that is there. And so, number 11, do you have to believe in sacred tradition? And his answer is yes, because it is the word of God and has equal authority with the Bible. And this is the teaching of the Catholic Church and always has been, because the church was there when the Bible was written, when the Gospels were written, when the Epistles were written. It was written, you might say, by the church. Uh, Saint, uh, or rather, Father Kogan says, the early Christians learned everything by tradition, since only later on were some of the teachings of Jesus written down. The last writing being done at the end of the first century. Uh, that is, there was no New Testament in the early church. Again, it gets back to the fact the church came first. Christ established the church, and the church existed long before the first word of the first gospel was written down long before St. Paul wrote his epistles, <clears throat> obviously long before the, the uh, Acts of the Apostles were written, the Apostles had to act. The church existed, it thrived, it acted, it converted, it grew long before St. Luke began to record the Acts of the Apostles. Um, so we have to accept that fact. And uh, those who've been misled by the false teaching of Martin Luther come back to reality. And the reality is the Catholic Church and the Catholic Church alone is the truth and has the true understanding of the Scriptures. It is she who protected the Scriptures with her very life's blood through all those centuries. And the only reason Protestants, including Martin Luther, even had a, had a Bible to begin with is because Catholics uh, copied it, uh, interpreted it, fought for it, bled for it, died for it for centuries before Martin Luther ever saw the light of day. We have to believe in sacred tradition, 
because sacred tradition is one of those uh, is one of the fonts of divine revelation, one of the sources, or you might say, conduits of divine revelation. The other being sacred scripture, but they go together. If you take sacred scripture away from sacred tradition, and you take sacred tradition away from sacred scripture, <clears throat> you do violence to both of them, and you do not have Christianity. Twelve, are you free to believe whatever you want? Answer, no. You have to believe everything in the Bible and tradition, scripture and tradition, all the doctrines which the Catholic Church teaches. And again, we go back to Second Thessalonians of St. Paul, chapter 1. The Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with the angels of his power in a flame of fire, giving vengeance to them who know not God, and who obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. <clears throat> so again, it really is a matter of not only knowing the truth, but obeying it in the way you live. We're not free to believe whatever we please. Uh, if there were no God, and if there were no truth other than what you made up, if that's the closest thing you could come to, uh, truth is whatever you're thinking or feeling at any given moment. Well, yes, well, fine. But then you have a world without any rhyme or reason, except whatever you impose, meaning you impose upon it. There are a lot of people who think this way today, no doubt about it. I mentioned existentialism before. Existentialism says basically you have your own experiences, you make up your own reality. This is a formula for insanity. They're saying there's no real objective reality. It's just what you think is, is reality in terms, of, in terms of how it affects you. There are a lot of people out there today who don't even think in terms of truth and falsehood, right and wrong. All they think of is how it affects them, how they feel about reality. <clears throat> That's, for them, the only reality. Not reality, but how they feel about it. Their feelings are all that matter to them. That's all that's real to them. But when you take a human being and you take that person out of contact with reality, and they're living in their own little world of their own fantasies, <clears throat> well, that's, that's a formula for insanity. And you wind up in an insane world. When you have a human population which is incapable of thought, but it's simply a bundle of passions and feelings. That's a formula for a global insane asylum. That's what happens when you, when you lose faith, true faith. And finally, number 13, what kind of sin is it to deny anything the Catholic Church teaches? Well, Father Kogan answers, usually it's a, it's a mortal sin, a serious sin. To deny what the Catholic Church teaches, if one really comes to face the fact that our Lord Jesus Christ said, He who hears you hears me, to his apostles, and the Catholic Church is founded upon the apostles, that the Catholic Church and the hierarchy of the Catholic Church uh, actually derives from the apostles whom our Lord sent out with the authority to speak in his name, to preach the gospel to every creature, to baptize, that is, to have the power to justify and sanctify the human soul, and to instruct on the commandments of our Lord how we are to live our lives to be faithful to him. If Christ gave that authority to his apostles, and this church is founded upon his apostles and traces its origins back to them, then that church speaks with that authority. I know the, the modernists have infiltrated the church, and we're, we're seeing something happening here that is very serious, I know that. But I'm talking about the traditional Catholic Church, as we've known it throughout all of the centuries, until this time of crisis. Um, if that church has spoken down through the ages with the authority of Christ, then obvious, obviously, if anyone denies that authority, and that authority being the authority of Christ that he he gave, he vested the church to have, to hold, to use, to teach mankind, then to deny that authority is to deny Christ and Christ's authority. 
And that would be a very grave sin. Now, Father Kogan gives some quick practical points here that I'm just going to read, uh, hopefully without comment here. Oh, well, I'll tell you what, I, uh, this uh, lesson has gone on uh, quite long enough. I'll leave the practical points aside right now. And uh, when we come back, uh, I'll resume with Lesson 3 and Lesson 4 for our next installment. That's the Lesson on God and the Holy Trinity and the Lesson on Prayer. May God bless you all.